After I wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature, I took a detour back into language. I tend to alternate books uh, with grand themes like human nature and human progress with more uh, specialized books on language and uh, cognition. I wrote a book called The Sense of Style, The Thinking Person's Guide to Writing in the 21st Century, where I tried to apply both my own experience as an academic who made the crossover and had to unlearn the bad habits of uh, academies, and as a psycholinguist, someone interested in how language works in the brain, to try to offer a new kind of advice on how to craft stylish and elegant uh, prose, one that didn't have the often scolding tone of a lot of the style manuals or a lot of the superstitions and uh, archaic rules about dangling participles and split infinitives, which linguists knew were nonsense and which don't even particularly lead to uh, good prose. After finishing The Sense of Style, I went back to uh, some bigger themes, and it came from the products of the better angels of our nature. I had documented that in many times and places, the world had become a better place, at least in terms of uh, reducing violence. And then at a conference of journalists and politicians, a reporter came over and asked me, what do you think it'll take to eliminate poverty? I, I kind of thought it was a trick question. Uh, you know, Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And I said, oh, redefine poverty. Someone came over to me after and said, you know, that was a cynical answer. The World Bank and uh, many organizations have set a goal of eliminating world poverty by 2030, and uh, we've made huge progress in doing it. I thought, wow, that's interesting. It showed me that it isn't just in reducing violence that we've made progress, but in uh, reducing, in this case, extreme poverty. And it led me to look at other dimensions of human well-being in addition to violence and uh, prosperity. And again, uh, to my surprise, there was a lot of good news that people are not aware of, such as that lives have been getting longer everywhere in the world, not just in, in the West, but even more dramatically in uh, Asia and Africa. Extreme poverty in decline, diseases in decline, illiteracy in decline. A majority of uh, people are literate now for the first time in history, girls, not just boys. And this too came as a kind of pleasant surprise, and one that I realized that virtually no one is aware of. Because the news concentrates on what goes wrong, certainly when there's a famine, when there's a pandemic, when there's a war, when there's a terrorist attack, you read about it. When there's a country that has eliminated um, a disease that's free of uh, war, where the girls are going to school, well, there's never a Thursday in October in which you, you read about it. And if, let's say, every day 137,000 people escape extreme poverty, there's not a headline, 137,000 people escape poverty again today and the next day and the next day. So it kind of creeps up on you. So uh, I thought that as with the better angels of our nature, this story, which I had learned from historians and economists and uh, development experts, um, deserved its own book. Uh, but once again, as a scientist, as a psychologist, I couldn't be satisfied with the idea that there's just this thing called progress that just makes us better off and better and better and that the longer you wait, the better humanity will be. That's just not the way the universe works. The universe is, is indifferent to our well-being. Often it even seems hostile. Uh, things fall apart. There are more ways for things to go wrong than to go right. We all depend on energy to stave off the decay of our, our bodies and our creations. Hate to interrupt. Wouldn't you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by the genius Steven Pinker, completely ad-free. Uh, there are the dark angels of human nature that always have to be uh, tamed. So if we do get better, it demands an explanation. And my best explanation was that it's the set of ideals that we loosely associate with the Enlightenment of the 18th century, which I identified as, first off, reason. That is, we use our collective brain power to figure out how the world works. We don't depend on authority or scripture or dogma or revelation or charisma or the feeling of subjective certainty, which is so pleasant but so wrong, that by being skeptical 
of dogma and authority, by always seeking to see whether our beliefs are true or false, by pushing our reason as far as we can, not relying on any one person's reason, because no human is uh, particularly reasonable, but if we have the right rules, we can be collectively more rational than any of us is individually. Rules like fact-checking, like the demand for empirical testing, like free speech. No one has the right to impose some dogma on anyone else. Anyone can say, well, maybe you're wrong. Uh, when you have those rules, then gradually you can come to a better and better understanding of reality. When that is applied to the physical world, we call it science. And science uh, deserves credit for some of the enormous advances in human well-being. Uh, particularly the science of public health, that people don't drop like flies when they're babies in their 20s and 30s from contaminated drinking water, from insect-borne uh, disease, from famine, from natural disasters. But all the reason and science in the world are not going to make people better off unless you set that as a goal. Not just the people close to you, yourself and your family, but everyone. And that is the moral philosophy that can be called humanism. The idea that the greatest good is the flourishing of human beings, and um, for that matter, sentient beings, including uh, conscious animals as well, but let's at least uh, start with humans. Now, that might seem obvious. Isn't everyone a humanist? Well, not necessarily. You might say that morality comes from following the laws of uh, scripture or worshiping the right deity or acts of heroic greatness of the brilliant and heroic few and the teeming masses can be damned, or the glory of the nation or the race or the dictatorship of the proletariat. There are all kinds of ideals that are proposed over human history other than the flourishing of uh, sentient humanity. So those three, reason, science, and humanism, when people do put their heads together, use knowledge of the way the world works in order to make people better off, in order to allow them to live longer, healthier, happier, richer, better educated uh, lives, can lead to progress, not automatically, not as a law of the universe, but just because when we figure out things that work and we remember them, when we look at the experiments that failed and decide let's not do that again, then bit by bit, we can make people better off, uh, and, and we have. Not automatically. There's no guarantee that progress will continue. Uh, it has never been the case that progress occurs everywhere evenly. It has never been the case that there are no setbacks, the recent pandemic being an example. The age-old curse of pestilence is always with us. The difference is that with science and reason applied to human flourishing, we can put our heads together to find measures to mitigate the pandemic while it's happening, to prevent it with vaccines, to treat it with drugs. So as with other pandemics, which have set humanity back in the past, but humanity has recovered, there's every reason to believe that humanity will, re will uh, recover from this one. So Enlightenment Now, perhaps my most ambitious book, and uh, I'd say it's my most controversial book, but for the fact that every one of my other books uh, might deserve the credit for being my most controversial book, but it was plenty controversial. You wouldn't think that a defense of uh, reason, science, and uh, human flourishing would uh, be particularly controversial, but it sure was. <laughs>